to Emmaus Lutheran Church in Orange City, Florida. I'm Pastor Mark Winkler, and um, if you are a guest here, we especially welcome you, and also the, those who are watching either live streamed or at some later point on your own computer or smartphone or tablet or whatever. I'm glad to be able to welcome all of you today. And uh, today is February 28th, 2021, and we finished another month in this year. We're still looking forward with hope and great gladness at uh, the possibility of, uh, you know, conquering this pandemic and, and being able to take our masks off and, um, and worship in something that feels a little bit like normal again. I'm still looking forward to that. So, um, a couple of announcements for you. Today is not my wife's birthday. Um, what else? We've got a concert next. She's shaking her head. I'm going to get hit for that later on. <laughs> if this were yesterday, I could not say that. That it's not her birthday. And get it. And her twin brother turned 60 yesterday. So then, here's, this is exciting. This is, I'm going to get hit twice for that. Um, so this is really exciting. I'm, I wish that... This was happening today at 3 o'clock in the afternoon next Sunday. We have a concert, another event in the Advanced Concert Series. And this is Heather Thorne and Vivacity. And um, Heather Thorne is a fabulous mother of a player. And um, you probably can you YouTube and search Heather Thorne. Okay. By that, look up Vivacity and she's going to be there too. Okay. So it's going to be fabulous, and hopefully a beautiful day, hopefully not too hot, um, but we your lawn chairs, bring umbrellas, I, I guess, or, you know, if you have those portable shelters, I, you know, I could see those being up in the parking lot, too. So bring whatever you have to make yourself comfortable next Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, Heather Thorne and Vivacity, and it will be a lot of fun. Um, Wednesday night. Last Wednesday, we had a Lenten service here at the church inside, and we had 19 people here. So as long as it's meeting and need, we'll continue, but if it seems like we're losing interest in worshiping inside on Wednesday nights, then probably Carol and I will just record it at home and post it, and you'll, you'll still, we'll get the Lenten experience, but it won't be gathered here in person in worship. So um, just, you know, kind of week by week with that. So watch the, watch your uh, email blast. If you're not receiving an email blast, <coughs> I'm kind of opening this up a whole lot here because even people watching from their equipment, um, if you want to be included in the weekly email blast and know what's going on and have all the, the um, information updated weekly, it is Emmaus. It just changed. <laughs> you know what? Rev underscore 82 at hotmail.com. That's me. And, and uh, okay, Rev underscore 82 at hotmail.com. And we'll put you on the list for, for getting all of the news and information. Okay, but I'm going to stop. Yeah. Emmaus office at EmmausOrangeCity.com. Emmaus office at EmmausOrangeCity.com. Okay. Nothing else. We have more important things to do. Um, so let's go. Holy and precious God, we give you thanks that you make your presence known through the simple gift of water, water that nourishes us and sustains all living things, water that through baptism adopts us into your holy family of faith, water that cleanses and, renew and renews and nourishes us. We ask God that you would send your Holy Spirit upon this water turning what is ordinary into what is holy. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, turning what is ordinary into what is holy. 
We pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon our congregation, our community, our nation, and the world, turning what is ordinary into what is holy. We ask for your presence to be announced in the holy word that is read and proclaimed today, that you would make your presence known to us through the body of Christ that we share in communion this morning. We pray, God, that you would enter into every heart and um, that you would fill people with a hope that is beyond their hoping, that you would fill us with a life beyond our understanding, that you would bring things into existence that do not yet exist. We give you thanks, God, for the the promises you have made and for your faithfulness in keeping your promises. We lift up this prayer, we lift up our lives, we lift up this time of worship and celebration all unto you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us to, so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, I'm just remembering. I get some criticism, not criticism, I get critique, there you go, um, about people not being able to hear. And part of it is the mass here on Sunday morning because the phone is not tied into the microphone. It's just picking up the ambient noise that it gets there. So it's getting from the speakers. But um, what if I what if I preached from back here and took the mask off? Put your hand up nice and high if you're against that. There's not a hand up. <laughs> so I'm going to read today from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, um, chapter 4. Paul writes, for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and who calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the pro promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Therefore, Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and who was raised for our justification. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> so, um, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let the people of God say together, Amen. 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 
So there are some interesting phrases in here that when I read them, I can't not overlook them. One is this, hoping against hope. This is describing Abraham. He was hoping against hope. I'm just leave you with that for a second when you think about what that might mean. And the other one was, as good as dead. I, I shake my head at that one, as good as dead. Um, now, Abraham was an old man when he received the promise that he and his wife Sarah would be the parents of a child that, and through that child would, would um, produce descendants from the line of Abraham, so many that they would not even be able to count them. As numerous as the grains of sand on the beach, um, as numerous as the stars in the universe, not in our sky, not in our galaxy, but the stars in the universe, in all of God's creation. And he was an old man when he got that promise from God, that he would become the father of a great many people. Now, I can imagine Abraham and Sarah hoping at some earlier time in their life, hoping that they could have a child, hoping that they could become the parents that they wanted to be. And then I imagine at some age began hoping that they didn't have a child because children take so much energy and, and, and it's good that that children are brought into this world through young parents. But when Abraham and Sarah received the promise, they were old. And it was even longer than that before Isaac was born into the world. And by that time, Abraham was about 100 years old when he became a father. That's old. I think hoping against hope was, was a matter of, of saying Abraham and Sarah had been hoping for the child that they wanted to have and to raise. And then hearing the promise that God made that said, you are going to have a child. Now Abraham is hoping against hope because that hope was gone, but now a new hope is in front of us. Even though Abraham was as good as dead, which still puzzles me, even though I understand it, it still puzzles me. puzzles me because if God can bring life from death and God can bring into existence things that do not exist, then God can also bring a child into a childless family. Now those statements begin to make a little bit of sense. Paul is writing to people in Rome who are new Christians they're not, they're not old Christians. They haven't had the word developed in, in among them. They're new Christians. And when they hear a sermon, they, it's new stuff. They react to it. They respond to it. But when they're not hearing a sermon each week, they begin to lose that momentum that gets built up when, when we have a, a movie, a growing, a vitalized um, faith thought of that this morning when I was thinking of vivacity, that, that, that sense of energy producing life. And for Paul, when he's writing to the people of Rome, he's writing to people whose, whose faith is, is uh, tender. It's, it's fragile. It's vulnerable. And Paul wants them to hold on to the faith that they have and even to find their faith strengthened. Because in here, um, it, it says here, I just can't find it. In verse 20, no distrust, he was talking about Abraham, no distrust on Abraham's part concerning the promise of God made him waver, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. He grew strong. That's, it's an okay English translation, but in Greek it re really means God made Abraham strong. God made him strong in faith. Does God not also make us strong in faith? 
Do we claim a faith on our own? According to Martin Luther, we cannot on our own, by our own um, strength or understanding, come to have faith. Let's paraphrase a little. I'm probably a little off on that. But we don't come to faith on our own. Faith is a gift of God through the Holy Spirit, and yet God strengthens that. As God strengthened the faith of Abraham, God strengthens our faith too. Now, it says in here, let me read back at verse 20, because you're going to see how we get involved. This is not an old reading, an old message for an old people from an old time. This is current. This is today. Listen, verse 20 and following. No distrust made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but God made him strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Therefore, Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone. If, you, if you're following and piecing this together, you know what I'm going to say next. Not for Abraham alone, verse 24, but for our sake also. For our sake also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who, is, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. That just sums up what we already know. Why did Jesus die? Because of our trespasses. What do we get out of Jesus dying for our trespasses, for our sins? Justification, churchy word, means this, that we are declared so completely innocent of our sins, it's as if we never committed them. Never. Now, that's not possible. In my human, earthly, limited mind, I, I cannot be innocent of things that I haven't said or done or thought to the point where it's as if I never did them, because I didn't. But God can do that. God can bring life from death. God can bring into existence things that do not exist. And God can declare us so completely innocent of our sins, our trespasses, that we are completely innocent as if we never did them. I want you guys to hear that because that's the mind-blowing part of this, of this lesson here. This lesson is fantastic with other imagery. Abraham and Sarah, a hundred years old, having a child who became the, the father of, of us all. We're all related to Abraham by faith and by, um, by the seed of Abraham. We are all connected with one another. That's fabulous. What's even more fabulous is this, that God strengthens your faith and mine. And God, who has brought life from death and, and calls into existence things that do not exist, looks at our sins and says, you are forgiven. Not only are you forgiven, you are now justified. <coughs> you are so completely forgiven, it says, if you never did them. And we can live in that freedom, and it, and, it, and it takes that burden of sin and guilt and shame off of our shoulders. Whatever you carry around as a burden day to day, you don't have to. I know we all have those tapes that run in our mind that remind us of things um, to redo that. You know, we all have that. But God has forgiven those trespasses against other people. Our broken promises. God forgives those. And God's promises are good. That's, a, that's what Abraham is, is about here. Um, uh, no distrust made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God. Abraham trusted God and trusted that God would make good on the promise that God made. The promise that 
he had in mind for Abraham and for Sarah and for all of us to have that promise of, of an extension of our life beyond our own. For the, for the Old Testament people, those Old Testament you know, Hebrew people, the Jews, they didn't have this idea of, of everlasting life that we have now. I mean, that came with Jesus. He, he died, he rose from the dead, he, he said, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I tell you that I go for a fair place for you? You know the way to the place where I'm going. I'm the way and the truth and the life. You know that. You know that promise. And uh, for the Old Testament people, they didn't have that concept. For them, the 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 promise of of life going on was through their descendants. You have no descendants, that, that's the end. But your descendants continue the life that you have lived, the life that God has given to you. Abraham trusted that what God said would be true, that his life would be extended through his ancestors. And guess what? You and I are ancestors. Abraham's life and faith and hoping against hope continues through you and through me. So, what are we going to do with that life today? What can we do with the life that God has given to us through the promise made to Abraham and Sarah? The promise that, that said, here's something impossible, having a child in your old, old age. But Abraham didn't doubt that. He laughed. Sarah laughed. They all laughed. God could have laughed at it. church exists today because the God who makes promises in the scriptures makes good on those promises. And we want to hear those promises. We want to, we want to be a part of this God who brings life from death and who may calls into existence things that, that do not exist. Where whatever hopelessness is going on in your life, whatever situation you feel and have gotten yourself into, all of that has been forgiven and you have been justified as if you had never done those. And we can hope against hope right along with Abraham. Hope against hope that the promises of God bring us to that place of everlasting life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Let us pray. God of hope, your gift of grace is meant for everyone. Give confident faith to your people everywhere, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. Holy Lord, all the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. Mighty God, you rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hold safe our service women and men as they are away and open the pathway for their return to homes and families. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. Gracious Lord, in Jesus you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Draw near to those who call on you for help. Open our eyes to the needs all around us and move us to respond in faith. Comfort those who live in despair and call to your side those finishing their life. Lord, in your mercy, Father God, who made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations, bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the, parent and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted into a forever family. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Take a moment now to think about your need for forgiveness, for justification, for reconciliation between yourself and God, between yourself and others. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing blood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God, all of your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus, who taught us all to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Um, take out of your um, communion wafer, the body of Christ, that has been consecrated ahead of time. In the night in which you would betray our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Take and eat. And now the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for serving others, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor.
God bless you that you may be a blessing to others in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> marked with the sign of cross, marked with the cross of Christ forever, go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.